My name's Andrew Moran. I'm the Head of Politics and International Relations at, at London Metropolitan University. What I want to do in the next few minutes or so is give you a kind of guided tour of the way in which people think about the presidency of the United States and the kind of theories that you'll come across as A-level students. And if you've gone to university, the kind of theories that you'll come across there. Now, interestingly, lots of academics have interpreted presidential power in different ways. One of, one of the most influential academics to do this was a man called Richard Neustadt, who published a book at the beginning of the 1960s called Presidential Power. And in this book, what Neustadt said was the key power that any president needed was the power of persuasion, that that power of persuasion had to be an ability to persuade those who worked for you to pursue your agenda, to persuade the media, to persuade the American public, that you needed those skills. So after Neustadt's theory, which puts this idea of the power of persuasion, we jump forward to another theory that was put forward at the end of the, sorry, at the beginning, rather, of the 1970s. And this was a notion put forward by a man called Arthur Schlesinger. And it was the notion of the imperial presidency. Now, Schlesinger said this, the problem is to devise means of reconciling a strong and purposeful presidency with equally strong and purposeful forms of democratic control. Or to put it succinctly, we need a strong presidency, but a strong presidency within the constitution. So it was about containing the powers of the presidency within the constitutional structure. Now, what's interesting here is that what followed Nixon was two presidents who experienced great difficulty within this structure and that they found that Congress in particular sought to grab back some of the powers that Johnson, Nixon and other presidents had essentially taken away from them. And, and this is interesting because one of the things that we see in this relationship between the presidency and Congress is there's an ebb and a flow in power that the power shifts between the two. Ford and Carter argued that the presidency was becoming imperiled. To talk about it being imperial, they said, wasn't true. <clears throat> in fact, what we were seeing was an imperiled presidency, which was made even worse, not just by Congress seeking to reassert its power, but also by the bureaucracy becoming so vast that presidents were now arguing they were finding it difficult to control it. We've kind of gone from that, that modern presidency of Roosevelt through to and the power of persuasion through to the imperial president presidency into the imperiled presidency. We can add to this another model, which is the theory of the two presidencies, which was put forward by Aaron Vildavsky. And Vildavsky argued that presidencies have much more power when it comes to foreign policy than they do the domestic. And if you look at the constitution, you can see that there are checks and balances here, but there are some ways that the president can get around some of these issues. We've seen Trump do this, that he's used executive orders, executive agreements, and he's used informal powers, the powers of social media, for example, uh, the bully pit that presidents are able to use. But there are checks from Congress, which I put down here, which are worth you looking at in your own time, and I'm sure you'll discuss on your courses. If we look at presidential theory, there are those who argue now that Trump isn't necessarily imperial. What he is, is unconstrained, unconstrained by a Republican Senate in Congress, unconstrained by a bureaucracy, which has been increasingly politicised. And it is an extraordinary time to be alive, to be studying American politics, to be studying politics full stop. Um, but what's interesting is the increasing discontent that we can see from Western democracies towards the USA and the Trump administration.